Yeah. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, Cosgrove with the Gray Zone. So back in May, I asked you about Gonzalo Lira. He was the U.S. citizen arrested in Ukraine for posting dissident content online. And you told me the State Department was aware of his arrest in May. And we learned last night through a series of tweets by him uh, that he had been tortured in the Ukrainian prison and he was now on a motorcycle with a broken rib trying to flee to the Hungarian border. And so I'm wondering, you know, if this is true, given the State Department knew of his arrest and his detention, how has this been allowed to occur? We have a U.S. citizen being arrested, being detained and perhaps tortured in the prison of one of our strongest allies. Well, you, you lost me with the perhaps and the if this is true. I think I'd want to verify those reports before I commented on them. Alex, go State ahead. Department Alex, work, go ahead. Is the State Department I, investigating? I, I, I just want to verify anything before I comment. Go ahead, Alex. And This is my video update from St. Petersburg, Russia on this Wednesday midday, August the 2nd. Let's talk about some news. And right now I am at the Hermitage Museum. Right over there is the world famous Hermitage Museum, which uh, has some of the finest art in the world and this museum is, is so massive that uh, they say you need something like three months to see every single room and every single piece of art in this museum a truly incredible uh, museum and an incredible place to be is uh, the Hermitage and if you do visit St. Petersburg this is probably your number one destination right here at the Hermitage. So let's, uh, let's talk about some news while we are here. And let's do a very quick update on what is going on with uh, Gonzalo Lira. I really don't have any, any new uh, news to pass on to everybody that is watching this video. What you know is what I know. Uh, Gonzalo, he... Uh, he put out a couple of videos, three videos, uh, yesterday and a pretty long uh, Twitter thread. And he said that he was close to the uh, border of Ukraine and Hungary, and he was planning to cross over into Hungary and seek political asylum. Uh, we're still waiting for, uh, for news from uh, Gonzalo. It's been over. 24 hours and we haven't heard anything yet there are some some reports unconfirmed but there are reports that claim that gonzalo was stopped by the ukraine border control but uh we don't know these are unconfirmed reports and let's just give it another day or two and hopefully gonzalo uh, puts out a video from hungary and uh hopefully he he has been granted political asylum. Hopefully he made it across the border and, has, and he has been granted political asylum. So let's give it another day or two and uh, let's uh, wait and see if Gonzalo does uh, reach out to, to every one of us. So from Gonzalo, Gonzalo Lira, an American citizen who is trying to escape uh, torture persecution, extortion from the Alensky regime and the U.S. State Department that apparently isn't too concerned about their own citizen. We can do an update on Julian Assange, a citizen of Australia who is being persecuted and tortured in a U.K. prison and faces extradition to the United States of America where he could be tried and sentenced to 140 years in prison. And Anthony Blinken, he was in Australia uh, just uh, a couple of days ago, and he was there with U.S. Uh, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and actually talked about Blinken's trip to Australia a couple of days ago. 
because uh, he gave an interview to 60 Minutes Australia and he was asked uh, what is the biggest threat to humanity and Lincoln said it was climate change, not nuclear war or nuclear conflict, but he said it was climate change. I talked about this in a video I did a couple of days ago. Uh, something that, uh, that has not been reported on with uh, Blinken's trip to Australia is that the question of Julian Assange was brought up and the Australian government, they requested that the United States drop its charges against Julian Assange. This is what Australian Foreign Minister Penny Wong said to Blinken, and I quote, We have made clear our view that Mr. Assange's case has dragged on for too long, and our desire that it be brought to a conclusion. And we've said that, public, and we've said that publicly, and you would anticipate that that reflects also the position we articulate in private, Wong said. Blinken confirmed that the issue has been discussed, but rejected Australia's concerns. He said Australia must recognize the U.S.'s position on Assange, claiming the WikiLeaks founder's alleged action risked very serious harm to our national security. That is a quote. Mr. Assange was charged with very serious criminal conduct in the United States in connection with his alleged role in one of the largest compromises of classified information in the history of our country, Blinken said. So I say that so I say that only because, just as we understand sensitivities here, it's important that our friends understand sensitivities in the United States. End quote from Anthony Blinken to the Australian government and to the Australian people and, uh, and to the request to drop charges against Julian Assange. Basically, Blinken told the Australian government, no chance. Buzz off is what Blinken told the Australian government. We are going to continue to pursue extradition of Julian Assange and we are going to try him and eventually punish him. An Australian citizen, this is an Australian citizen who is facing 140 years in a U.S. prison and has been four years, four plus years, in a UK prison and, and most people don't even know on what charges, what is he being charged with? Most people don't even know. So that is the, uh, that is the update on Julian Assange. He's being charged with telling the truth. That's what he's being charged with, for telling the truth. So from, uh, from Gonzalo Lira to Julian Assange, to Donald Trump, and this is the big news of the day that dropped uh, yesterday, and that is that uh, we have another Trump indictment. Another Trump indictment has dropped, and this one is connected to January 6th. And let me read you a bit about this latest indictment against the former U.S. President. The Republican 2024 frontrunner faces four charges, conspiracy to defraud the United States, conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding, obstruction of an attempt to obstruct an official proceeding, and conspiracy against rights. The indictment also lists six unnamed co-conspirators, including four lawyers, a Justice Department official, and a political consultant. The charging document alleges that by disseminating false claims about his victory, creating an intense national atmosphere of mistrust and anger, and eroding public faith in the administration of the election, Trump laid the groundwork for his conspiracies, all of which it claims targeted a bedrock function of the United States' federal government. That's the indictment. That's the January 6th indictment, and those are the new charges that have been brought against Donald Trump, former U.S. President Trump. <laughs> Banana Republic, everybody. The United States is becoming 
a banana republic. Some people will, will argue that the United States already is a banana republic. By tweeting and by making a couple of statements, maybe one speech, they say that Trump created the atmosphere, the atmosphere of mistrust and anger and eroded public faith in elections. I'm speechless. I am absolutely speechless. The way they are going after this man. Love him or hate him, or you're indifferent to Donald Trump, the way they are going after this man is, is simply wrong. And it's destroying the United States. It really is destroying the United States. Here you have the Biden administration going after its main political rival. And they're going to lecture the world about democracy and rule of law. And they're going to talk about conflict with Russia in order to protect Ukraine's democracy. What do these people know about democracy? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. And isn't it interesting that, uh, that this indictment dropped a day after Devin Archer's testimony, where he pretty much connected the dots between Hunter, Burisma, Ukraine, Slochewski, Shokin, and the big guy. Interesting timing for this indictment. It's not the first time that we've seen indictments uh, come out against Donald Trump right at the same time that you had some pretty bad news coming out against Joe Biden. Not a coincidence at all. So that is the indictment against Trump. And you know, the, uh, the whole January 6th thing is, uh, when you look at it from the outside, looking in like you're not in the United States and you're, and you're looking into what is happening in the United States from another country, the whole January 6th thing is absolutely ridiculous. It's embarrassing, disgraceful and embarrassing. They have been going on about this, this insurrection now for how long? Two years, three years, they've dragged this on. This happened when, January 2000, what was it, 2021? And they've dragged this thing out for over over a year plus, close to two years, three years, <laughs> I don't know, my timing is terrible. Let's just say two years, they've been dragging this thing out. It's now the summer of 2023, and they're still talking about January 6th. I've seen protests in Greece, like just your weekend protest do more damage to, uh, to the city of Athens than what was done at, uh, at this insurrection. God honest truth. I mean, get over it. The U.S. has overthrown governments. Like they've initiated coups on governments and torn countries apart. And I've seen countries just not talk about it after six months. Like they've forgotten about the coup. Like the coup in Turkey happened, when was it, 2016? And six months later, no one was talking about it. This is after they tried to overthrow Erdogan and they tried to kill Erdogan and shoot down his plane. I remember it. And six months later, it was just a non-story. And that was it, you know, Turkey moved on, let's say, six months later or a year later. And the U.S. is still, the Democrats and the deep state, they're still uh, fixated on this event. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. It really is. It really is embarrassing. So, uh, yeah, they, they know how to drag things out. That's, that's what uh, the deep state does best. It controls uh, the information space and it knows how to, how to drag out the stories that, uh, that are useful to, to the deep state narrative. It really knows how to get the most out of those stories. And that's what it's been doing with uh, January 6th. And uh, that's what it's going to do with Ukraine. And I've been saying this for a while now, that uh, the goal of Sullivan and the goal of, uh, of the United States, or at least one of 
the main goals of the U.S. is to drag out the, uh, the conflict in Ukraine and to drag it out at least until the uh, November elections. That's what they're going to try to do. And, and I know there's, there's a lot of analysts and people saying no chance that they're going to be able to drag out this war for another uh, year and a half. They'll, they'll figure out a way. They will figure out a way to drag this thing out. They made Afghanistan last for 20 years. They're making January 6th last for two, three, four years. They're going to they're gonna drag January 6th all the way to, to the elections as well. So they'll figure out a way to make, uh, to make the conflict in uh, Ukraine drag out. Unless Russia does something to to bring it to a conclusion. But um, we have a Politico article which came out yesterday on August 1st. And let me pull it up here. And the title of this article from Politico is No Breakthrough Yet in Ukraine's Counter Offensive. <laughs> no breakthrough yet, yet in Ukraine's Big counteroffensive. This is the counteroffensive reboot, right? This is not the big counteroffensive that was launched on uh, June 4th. This is the rebooted counteroffensive that was launched a week and a half ago. And let me read you some of what uh, Politico says here. If Ukraine's supporters were hoping for a breakthrough after Kiev's forces made a new push in the southeast of the country last week, they were sorely disappointed. The latest attack, which saw Ukraine throw in thousands of Western-trained reinforcements to drive south from the town of Orekiv, have not yet yielded significant results. U.S. Defense Department officials told National Security Daily, NATSEC Daily, this week, with one noting that the gains are being measured in the hundreds of meters. Ukraine now has 150,000 troops committed to the operation across three axes of attack, including multiple Western-trained brigades, said one of the DOD officials, who, like others interviewed for this newsletter, was granted anonymity to discuss operational details. But Kiev is still keeping a number of forces in reserve as soldiers continue probing heavily mined Russian defenses for weak spots. They are making mostly small incremental gain on all three axes, the official said. They are still facing stiff Russian resistance, second and third layer of defenses. Even when Ukrainian forces manage to clear a minefield in advance, Russia will use artillery and helicopters to drop more mines behind them, trying to trap units between minefields, according to a person who advises the Ukrainian government to the American-made Vampire counter drone systems, a laser guided missile launcher that can be quickly installed in a truck bed, are finally arriving, which will give the front lines a small mobile air defense capability that could potentially help protect those units. The person said the vampires are the new wonder weapon. Anyway, uh, Ukrainian forces are eagerly awaiting the arrival of the U.S. Army's M1 Abrams main battle tank, which is expected as soon as early September and will help punch through Russia's defensive lines. But as the operation grinds on, DOD officials expect the counteroffensive will last at least through the fall and possibly into the winter. And possibly into the, into the winter. So the vampires, that's going to be the next wonder weapon. And then the wonder weapon after the vampires is going to be the Abrams tanks. And uh, they're going to drag this on through to till the winter. And then from the winter, they'll figure out a way to drag this on through to the spring. And then they're going to talk about another big counteroffensive in uh, the spring summertime. And they're going to drag it out until the fall of uh, 2024. And they'll get to the elections in the winter. That's how they're trying to play this. Not all of DC, but a lot of DC. That's how they're trying to play this, this conflict. They're trying to drag this out until the last Ukrainian, right? 
That's their policy. That's their strategy. So we have a lot of wonder weapons on the way. We got vampires on the way. We got Abrams tanks on the way. And, and those Abrams tanks, by the way, are not going to have all the latest tech. They're going to strip them down. So those Abrams tanks are going to burn just as nicely as the Leopard tanks burned. The UK was the smart ones. They said, don't send the Challenger tanks. We don't want to see them burn. But it looks like the Biden White House is ready to see those Abrams burn on the battlefield. And then, of course, we're going to have the the F-16s, and those are going to be sent sometime in, in September, October, November. God knows when, but you're also going to get the F-16s. And they're going to try to drag this thing out. But this article is an admission that uh, the Alensky regime is losing. It is a clear admission that the Alensky regime is losing. And, uh, and the strategy is indeed to try and figure out a way to keep this thing going. That's what they're looking to do. Let's, uh, let's walk straight up this way and go through this park and maybe even get to the, to the river here. So uh, that's the article from Politico. They're making mostly incremental gains, it says. They're making gains measured in meters, which is basically Politico saying they're making no gains at all, none whatsoever. Keep in mind that the plan, the original plan was within three to five days, they were going to be at the Sea of Azov. That was the plan. And then the reboot plan was within one to three weeks. They, uh, they were going to capture the city of Melitopol. And now they're just making gains measured in meters. Meters, like meters, <laughs> you know? But we have more wonder weapons on the way. So that's the article from Politico, and I guess we can talk about a little bit about the escalation that is taking place in Niger, and then we can get to our clown world. And so the French government and the Italian government, they are evacuating their their citizens and I believe their embassy staff, they are evacuating them from Niger as things continue to unravel in this African nation since the military coup took place. And uh, this is a troubling sign because if they're evacuating their, their citizens and their embassy staff, then it could be, it could be an indication that something is about to go down. Not necessarily, doesn't necessarily mean that, but it could be an indication that we're heading for, for some big trouble in, uh, in Niger. And we have a report which claims that the military junta in uh, Niger, they are banning uranium and gold exports to France. Niger is the world's seventh largest uranium producer, accounting for 5% of global output, according to the World Nuclear Asso Association. French media reports say the country accounts for 15 to 70% of uranium used in France to generate electricity. Eurotom, the European Atomic Energy Community, told Reuters on Tuesday that the West African country was the second largest supplier of natural uranium to the EU bloc last year. So Niger has these resources that the EU and France desperately need. Uh, EU governments are evacuating their citizens from the country and we've had reports which claim 
that France is considering considering airstrikes towards towards Niger, which is not going to be an easy task because the French military is severely depleted and it may not have the logistic capabilities to uh, launch successful airstrikes against Niger. And so, uh, speaking to Alexander about this the other day, he said that one of the, the strategies of Europe that they're working on right now is to try and get the neighboring nations in Africa to actually launch a conflict against Niger for the European nations. And uh, Nigeria may be the country that the EU nations are going to try and, uh, and work on to launch, uh, launch an invasion of some sort of conflict, an intervention against Niger. Let's cross. So that's the escalation in Niger. It's getting very, very serious and very dangerous. And so we will absolutely keep an eye on what is going on in Niger. So we should do a clown world now. Let's cross the bridge. Let's cross the bridge. So in this clown world, as we cross over to the other side, we'll talk about a German Green Party Parliament member. And this Green Party Parliament member, he is actually calling on the German people to give up more of their wealth, to give up all of their wealth, according to German Green Party MP Johannes Wagner. And this is what he tweeted the other day. It's such a shame that so many people don't see or don't want to what incredible prosperity we have in Germany we are one of the richest countries on earth. We can still give so much and also have a moral obligation to do so. <laughs> give up more of your money, Germany. Give it up to the, to the green climate change globalist gods. That is what this Green Party official is asking you to do. <laughs> uh, these Green Party members. Germany should pass a law when all of this is, is said and done and all of this madness is, is over and Germany finally comes to its senses. Germany should pass a law which says that uh, Green Party members are not allowed within 500 meters, no, 500 kilometers of the, uh, of the parliament building. And <laughs> that's what they should do. They should pass some sort of law prohibiting Green Party members from uh, even getting close to the levers of power. <laughs> that's that's a good way to make sure that Germany doesn't uh, self-destruct again. To be fair to, to this Green Party politician, he did tweet afterwards that, uh, that there should be a redistribution of wealth of the super rich. He did say that, so he didn't really explain what his plan was for the redistribution of wealth of the super rich, but I'm sure that some of the money would go to the Alensky regime. <laughs> oh, 
All right, I think I'm going to end the video there as we make our way over to the other side of this bridge. If you want to stay with me, stick with me till I make it to the other side. That would be cool. The Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, and Rockfin. And go to the Duran shop. Use the code Good Day. 10% off on all of our merch. That guy right there. That guy right there, he, he's living the life. He is living the life. Good man. Fishing in St. Petersburg. All right, let me leave you with this view. It's a bit windy, but let me leave you with this view right here.